Hi, dear students and friends. I am back with another classic romantic poem of one of the great English romantic poets, Percy Bysshe Shelley. The poem is Ozymandias of Egypt. This is the fourth poem in the syllabus of class 11th Anthology of English Poetry of the Council of Higher Secondary Education, Manipur. I divide my video into three sections. First is Life of the Poet, Percy by Sally, and the second is about the poem, Ozymandias of Egypt, and the third is the explanation of the whole poem. So after watching my video, you will know all these three points. Now let me pick up the first point about the life of the poet, Percy by C. Shelley. Percy by C. Shelley was born on 4th August 1792 in Horsham, Sussex, England, and passed away on 8th July 1822 at the age of 30 in Gulf of La Spezia, Kingdom of Sardinia, Italy. He was the eldest son of Sir Timothy Shelley and Elizabeth Philfold. He had four younger sisters and one younger brother. His father was a Whig member of the Parliament for Horsham and his mother was a Sussex land owner. As his father and mother belonged to the elite class, that means they were all aristocratic people, his childhood was somehow comfortable. He got all he wanted, all he needed. So somehow uh, his childhood would not be called a very unhappy one. Shelley was educated at Eton and Oxford University. He began to develop a strong hatred of tyranny of the privileged classes while at Eton. He was influenced very much by one radical member of parliament of Westminster, Sir Francis Burdett, when he met this fellow once in the House of Commons. At university, Shelley started reading books by radical political writers such as Tom Peony and William Godwin. He wrote a pamphlet on the necessity of atheism, attacking the idea of compulsory Christianity. This resulted him to be expelled from the Oxford University in 1811. Shelley could not be controlled. He moved to Ireland and began to give speeches on religion and politics. He wrote another political pamphlet entitled A Declaration of Rights on the Subject of French Revolution. Shelley kept writing pamphlets supporting radicals with his strong suggestion for a national referendum on electoral reform and improvement in working class education. Thus, when we study the life of Percy Vice Shelley, we find him to be restlessly thinking about the common people who had been deprived of their birth right. He consistently strive for them. Shelley became a key member of a close circle of visionary poets and writers. Some of the prominent members of this circle were Lord Byron, John Keats, Late Hunt, Thomas Le Peacock, and his own wife, Mary Shelley. Some of the best known works of P.B. Shelley are Ozymandias of Egypt, which I'm going to explain a few minutes later, O to the West Wind, To a Skylark, Music, When Soft Voices Die, The Cloud, and The Mask of Anarchy. Shelley's unconventional life and uncompromising idealism, combined with his strong, disapproving voice, made him an authoritative and much denigrated figure during his life. Besides writing poems, Shelley wrote dramas, essays, and novels as well. Shelley married Harriet Westbrook in 1811 and remarried Mary Shelley in 1816 after the date of his first wife Harriet. 
So this much is the, about life of P.B. Shelley and I'll now go on to the second part about the poem Ozymandias of Egypt. Percy Bessie Sally's Ozymandias of Egypt was written sometime between December of 1817 and January of 1818. It was probably the result of a sonnet competition between Shelley and uh, one of his close friends, Horace Smith, who stayed the winter of 1817 and 1818 with the Shelleys in his home in England. Both of them wrote the same sonnets on Ozymandias. Shelley's sonnet was published on 11 January 1818 in the weekly journal called The Examiner, owned by his very close friend, Late Hunt. Ozymandias takes the form of a sonnet in iambic pentameter. It is a strange mixture of Petrarchant and a Shakespearean sonnet. It has a typical rhyme scheme A B A B A C D C E D E F E F when compared to other English language sonnets. Some scholars believe that Shelley was inspired by the acquisition of a large fragment of a statue of Ramses II, the great pharaoh from the 13th century BC by the British Museum. There is another source of inspiration of the composition of this poem. Shelley and Horace Smith chose a passage from the writings of the great Greek historian Deodorus Seculus, which describes a massive Egyptian statue and quoted its inscription. I quote, King of kings, Ozymandias I am. If any want to know how great I am and where I lie, let him outdo me in my work. Ozymandias has two settings. The first is the place where the narrator meets the traveler and the second is the setting in the traveler's tale about a crumbling statue of an Egyptian king. Now let's go on to the characters found in the poem. There are four characters in the poem Ozymandias of Egypt. First is the narrator. The, the poet P.B. Sally is the narrator and second is the traveler. He is a person from an ancient land who tells his tale to the narrator. This person may be the Greek great historian Deodorus Seculus. Third is Ozymandias. He was an Egyptian pharaoh who is the subject of the traveler's tale. Let me say a few more words about Ozymandias. Ozymandias is another name of the Egypt's most famous ruler, Ramses II, who is also known as Ramses the Great. This ruler was born in 1314 BC and ruled Egypt for 66 years as the third king of the 19th dynasty. He was believed to have died between 90 and 99 years of age. He was a warrior king and a builder of temples, statues and other monuments. He was Pharaoh at the time Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt is recounted in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. The fourth is the sculptor. He is the craftsman who sculpted the statue of Ramses II. Now, a few more words about the statue. The statue of Ozymandias. The statue of Ozymandias, that is, the statue of Ramses II was originally 57 feet high. The head of the statue weighed 7.25 tons. It means the statue of Ozymandias was a very huge structure. Ramses II was one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt and he is known not only for his building programs 
but also for several ambitious foreign military campaigns and for his diplomacy as well. Let me now give you the actual meaning of the word Ozymandias, the great name given to Ramses II, that is Ozymandias. Ozy, O-Z-Y, Ozy comes from the Greek word Ozium, O-Z-I-U-M, which means air. And uh, Mandias comes from the word Mandet, which means to rule. So Ozymandias is the ruler of air or the ruler of nothing. Now let us read the poem Ozymandias of Egypt and do detailed analysis of the words and the lines of the poem so that we may know what P.B. Sally wants to convey to his readers. I met a traveller from an antique lane who shaped two vast and the trunkless legs of stone stained in the desert. In these three lines of the poem, there is an encounter between the speaker and a traveller that comes from an antique lane. It is narrated in the first person. Here, the narrator will be none other than P.B. Shelley, the poet himself. So, I here means P.B. Shelley. The traveller will surely be the Greek historian Deodorius, Seculist. He is from the antique lane. Antique here means old, then antique lane may be Greece or Egypt. Sally uses the adjective antique to increase the distance between the mighty figure that was once Ozymandias and the present time. Vast legs indicate that the man who built them had the power and money to build huge statue and trunkless means without a torso. So it is a pair of legs with no body, sense of destruction and loss is well felt with the use of desolate words like vast, trunkless, desert, antique lane, etc. Now Let's read the next lines. Near them on the saint, half shunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkle leaf and sneer of cold command. In these lines, we see Percy Bassey Sally describing the broken face of the statue fallen on the saint. The human face figure was seen partially buried in the saint. Only the head and the legs of the statue are shown to the readers. This is a very chaotic, inhuman and unintimidating scene. Sally's use of the words like shattered, frowned, wrinkled and cold portrays the, the proud nature of Ozymandias. The sculptor knew the character of the Parau so well that he sculpted all those qualities very distinctly on the face and lips. Sally is very specially excellent for not forgetting to draw the mark of vanity in the face of the king. Rather, he describes very minutely every detail of the face. The face was frowning, the lips were wrinkled, meaning the putile power of Ozymandias. It ultimately reflects the cruelty and the inhuman character of the king. The sculptor of the statue tried his best to reflect the power and aggressiveness of the king. Let's now read the next lines. Tell that sculptor well those patients rate, which yet survive stamped on those lifeless things, the hands that mocked them and heard that fate. In these lines, P.B. Shelley sips his story to the sculptor. The sculptor must be a faithful servant of Ozymandias. He would surely be thinking to depict all the patience of the king in his statue. By the skillful hands of the sculptor, the mean 
and shelf center lower human qualities of the king were well sewn on the face of the statue. Though the statue is made of lifeless stone, the patience of the king are made alive still. It was the sculptor's hand that mocked the king's heart. The words survive and lifeless in the seventh line have several purposes. A question arises in mind. How can the king's emotions still survive if they are only being represented by an inanimate piece of rock? It may be assumed that lifelessness of a thing makes the thing live on forever. This paradoxical element strengthens the overall theme of the poem that is, all living things, no matter how great, cannot outmatch the force of time. Now let us go on to the state of the poem, that means the remaining second part of the poem. And on the pedestal, these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Here, in these lines, we find the traveler describing the last thing about the statue, that is, the pedestal on which the statue once stood very firmly. The use of the word pedestal shows the mighty power of the king. It also serves a very important purpose in the overall structure of the poem. The end of the ninth line has the poem's first and only colon serving to hold back the reader from moving on, building up anticipation of what the words might say. The king's engravings on lines 11 and uh, 10 surface the climax of the poem. Every word displays power, prestige and boastfulness of the king. It says, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, yet mighty in despair. All these words reflect the pride and arrogance of the king. First, he declares his name and uh, states that he is the king of kings. It's an awful lot of ego. By calling himself king of kings, he alludes to God and believes he is greater than all other men. In the Bible, no doubt, Jesus is also described in the same way. These ultimate superiority and the pride blind any leader from seeing how a civilization is running and thus they cannot fix the fatal effect of nature. The exclamation mark used here with the word despair is the final emphasis of Ozymandias' ego. We find one more literary technique in these lines. Sally capitalized words like works, W-O-R-K-S, with capital W, and mighty, with capital M. Referring to Ozymandias, believing him to be a divine being. The final word of the 11th line is perhaps the most genius and uh, expressive in the entire poem. Instead of telling the reader to admire or respect his empire, he wants them to despair. He wants everyone to be jealous of or flat out sadden by his awesome empire. Despair also has an ironic effect. He did not know that he was foreshadowing the eventful decline of his own empire. Let's now go on to, uh, to the last triplet of the poem. Nothing besides remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and where the lone and level saints stretch far away. For the first time here, P.B. Shelley uses a full stop in his poem. It completely holds the reader's momentum and even 
expectations to some degree there is nothing there now only the ruined statue is there to remind to us how human powers and pride passes perhaps it also reveals how the sculptor mock Ozymandias. What is still standing is not Ozymandias' work. Art last, not the earthly power, political or not. The conclusion of the poem describes the setting of the desert as the boundless and bare and alone and level. These alliterations help the readers visualize just how expansive the landscape around the crumbled statue is. The statue of Ozymandias and his empire is quite insignificant when compared to the physical setting of the desert, which may be the Sahara Desert. The word boundless may refer to the infiniteness of time and Ozymandias, pure decades of supremacy, will forever be lost as time moves on. It will only be bare and lonesome. After having detailed explanation of Ozymandias of Egypt, I would like to conclude my discussion with a few remarks. Sally is ridiculed of the powerful king, powerful Egyptian ruler Ramses II, and the pharaoh's arrogant boast on the pedestal was a veiled condemnation of the English government under King George III. Sally abhorred oppressive monarchical government and favored revolution to overthrow it. Sally, being inspired by the radical political writers, inclined more on the revolution for equal rights and equal opportunities. In his Ozymandias of Egypt, he focuses on the decay of the ultimate destiny of authoritarian rule of Britain foreshadowing the fate as the Ozymandias, if it did not change its way. Thank you so much for your patient viewing. And next time, I'll be back with another beautiful poem. Till then, goodbye, take care.